Welcome to Fulham Fix. Uh, we have a, uh, a proper legend now. We yeah, go, yeah. We're going back to the uh, to some of the uh, the glory days, climbing those uh, climbing those tables. The and, halcyon uh, making years. Our, we're making our way to the Premier League, and this guy was key. Yeah, well, especially anyone our age or older, really, uh, thinks probably will always think of this period of time in Fulham's history as um, the most exciting when it mm. divisions. And John Sagana came in. Now, when I think of the great midfielders in Fulham's history, um, obviously think of Danny Murphy, Musa Dembele, mm. uh, Jao Polina, uh, going Johnny Haynes. Mm. I would say Lee Clark is another one. He was a but brute, like, wasn't he? he was strong. He was. He was box to box. He did box to box. Say. Did a bit of everything, you know. Yeah, yeah, and just a, like a really pivotal like character in that time. You mm. know, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it really felt like, oh, we're going places now. Lee Clark's like decided to step down and play for Fulham. Yeah. So it was great to just see, as it always is with these like legends, to see him back at the cottage and mm. with such warmth for it. Yeah, it was beautiful, wasn't it? Without a doubt, yeah, it was and lovely. We, and we, when, when you see it in a second, you were cut to the, in the bar. There's a photo of him hugging Rufus Brevet. But it was just like he's, yes. he's he's almost looking over my shoulder at while he's yeah, telling yeah. the stories, which gave it a nice sort of like rose tinge sort of like memory to the whole thing, didn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, it, it really it does, and it, it is like the, I think um, this out of uh, a lot of the interviews does feel like stepping back to a beautiful time, like Definitely. talking to him in in, in in Fulham history. So yeah, should enjoy. Go, should we go meet him? Yeah, let's do it. Lee Clark, welcome to Fulham Fix. Thanks for having us. Delighted uh, to be back, mate. I'm feeling. All kinds of warmth just looking at your face from here <laughs> because I have some of the best memories of my life as a teenager watching you play on this Fulham team. We're, we're in the flag, which is like a matter of metres away from the Johnny Haynes thing. Yeah. Like being back here, how does it feel, first of all? Amazing. I love the club. It's a special place in my heart. Club that I enjoy playing for, as you said, we had great success. Um, great group of lads, but the relationship I had with you guys, the support as was immense, you know. So, really special place, and I enjoy coming coming back to to spend time here and watch games. Well, mate, that's because you were very symbolic. Um, me and I were talking about this before you just come in, but of a period of time at Fulham because obviously there was a takeover and we got promoted from the bottom division only a couple of years before you came but when that was happening you were playing at the highest level yeah. and we had a, a flux of players like maybe Beardsley, Solarco some big names but maybe a little bit past their prime Yeah, and it was only when you and Chris Coleman Chris, came yeah. actually that you were at your exact prime in your careers yeah. and made the decisions come to Fulham that it kind of filled the place with oh this is a serious proposition yeah. now it's a different club to what anyone thought yeah, of you talk about those days and I remember when I'd done the press conference um, for my signing I'd done some of it in Motspur Park and I'd done some media stuff yeah, at the cottage and uh, there was a fans group you probably know the name of it but they were a fans group who'd been formed just I think five years previous when the club yeah, finished 91 out of 92 yeah mm. Fulham and that, that put was. my uh, you know, my signing in the context of what was going on. Yeah, yeah I was signing for the most ambitious club outside of the Premier League at the time. Yeah. The owner, when I signed Mohammed, he made it clear that he wanted the team in the Premier League as quickly as possible. Yeah. Thankfully, we'd done it within two years of me getting here. But uh, so, yeah, it was it, that, that put it in perspective for me. Yeah. Is, that, is that how it was sold to you? So when Alf Ayed came to you, he was like, this is the project, this is what we want to do. Yeah, because I'd obviously just got promoted with Sunderland and it was well documented why I was having to leave there, but there was obviously Premier League clubs. And to be perfectly honest to you, when I played uh, for my previous two clubs and we played in London, I never ever thought I'd be living down here or play here because I thought the place would over rose with being a lad from the North East. Right. You know, we used to come down the day before the game and I'd go for a walk by myself sometimes in the morning wherever we were situated in the hotel. Just felt it was so big, London, the place. But yeah. so never felt that I would ever come down here. So it was even in my mind when I, you know, got the call from Paul Bracewell and Neil Rodford at the time to come and meet. They agreed a fee. Um, I didn't think it would happen, but it's a, a brilliant decision in terms of my my playing career. Oh man, absolutely. There's a couple of things I want to pick up. You just said to there. Firstly, Bracewell is an he's an inter interesting part of. Fulham's history, Paul Bracewell, because he sort of joined the dots a little bit where he was a big profile guy and mm -hmm. had a season that was relatively successful, but not yeah. the lengths we went, went to. But he, would you have come to the club if Bracewell wasn't there? Was there an existing relationship I think, I between think the two of you? I think he played a big part because obviously I'd, 
I was the young player and he was the older player when the Newcastle team that sure, got promoted yeah. and then he was the assistant manager mm. to Peter Reid at Sunderland when I went there. So Paul played a big part in my playing career. So for him to be the manager, that yeah. made it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is the first time I'm coming out of the North East, basically. So I'm coming out of that bubble. <laughs> so for me to have someone like him, yeah. we'd also just signed Andy Melville on a free. Fulham, he came on a free. That's so I'd right. played with Mel at uh, Sunderland Sun, the previous yeah. year when we won the championship. So that was a good good one as well. But then I quickly got a rapport with a lot of the lads, and especially Chris, he became a real good friend of mine, Chris Coleman. He had many good friends, to be honest, but Chris did, and then, you know, as the history books will know, he became my manager, not just my best friend. I know, mate. right. <laughs> it's yeah. so yeah. weird you're saying good friends, because I think of all those names as good friends yeah. of us yeah, as yeah, well yeah. from watching totally. it. They were totally. like, really felt yeah. like that. I mean, the other thing I wanted to say, though, is you said it's well documented what happened at Sunderland before it came to Fulham, but I don't know if a lot of Fulham fans will know that story. How, like, I mean, you must have said, told it many times. Yeah, there was an incident when I went to watch Newcastle play in the FA Cup final as a <coughs> Sunderland player, and as I started mingling before the game with the Newcastle fans, I got, you know, thrown on a T-shirt that was derogatory to the Sunderland fans, yeah. so that meant my tenure there had to finish. Um, you got given the T-shirt? They, they put it on me as I jumped out the oh. car in Baker Street and then... It wasn't the, they were That's the, the story and I'm sticking to <laughs> it. They weren't, they weren't the days of the camera phone. They were the days of the disposable cameras. Yeah. And a couple of weeks later, I got put in the media and um, obviously I knew my time was up. Yeah. Um, Did it feel like Still that? spoke. To, I just met my ex-chairman of Sunderland a, a few weeks ago. Or so and we talked about that and, you know, it was... Because I had to have the meeting with him to say that it was untenable, which I knew then that I couldn't play. It's basically... A, can't bite the hand that feeds you, can you? And that's what right. I've done. So, um, and a lot of people think it was set up because I'd had a couple of weeks earlier. I went to see Peter Reid and said it was impossible for me to play in the Premier League against Newcastle. Now Fulham fans will find that a bit weird because oh, wow. I played against them many times for Fulham <laughs> and actually scored the winner uh, down <laughs> yeah. here when we beat them two one. I think in one of Chris's first games as manager. Yeah. Right. But it's different. It's it's yeah, it is. It, 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 we had Derby playing for the, the club that you support against, for their rivals, just didn't sit right with us. Wow. But when I played for Fulham, there was never any thought process of me not worrying about playing against Newcastle. I sure. wanted to win those games so were you for ask, Fulham. Were you so. asking at that point, when you had that conversation, what was your hope, I suppose, with Sunderland, that they would say, OK, well, will those games you sit out, we, we won't have you? No, not at all. Um, I just asked Pete, Peter Reid, my then manager, who was a great guy, that... Know, to understand the situation and he wouldn't want a player that's not committed. I mean, you can't right. have a player that does that or I kind of pick him in two games because he's not prepared to give of his best, mm. the big question marks. And I don't even know if that would have been the case because you know as Fulham fans, that was the one constant I had, no matter how well or bad I was playing, I give everything in every game. So that was... Um, that was that was the thing. It was We just got beat there with our two legs by Leicester City in the in the... League Cup, whatever it was called in those days, it's had so many name changes. And I remember after the second leg, I'd been on li live on, on Sky TV, and I went into Peter's office, and he was with his big friend Andy Gray, who was commentating for Sky then, and said, "We need to have a word." And now we've the, the cup so over, but we've already had the league wrapped up. You know, I need to tell you what my thoughts are. And there was a few expletives come out of Peter's <laughs> mouth, as you can imagine, and just tell us to. Get get on with it and get cracking. So, so I think when people hear that story, they think maybe it was a set up from my side in terms yeah, yeah. of getting that incident to happen. But <coughs> it, it wasn't a hundred percent. I'm honest and tell you, if it, if if that was the case, I would come out with it and say that was the story. And I I love the little sliding doors moments of, in life that happened in football because mm. if that hadn't happened, the person that put the t-shirt on you, you wouldn't have come to Fulham mm. and we wouldn't have had those years, which you were completely integral to. Yeah. And it's like really interesting you saying that you felt like London was too big for you because the impression that I had when you came is that you were much bigger than the club. Mm. So your sort of, the way your body language exuded across the cottage was like that you could run the show. Yeah. And I don't know whether that's because Sun and Newcastle, the grounds are a bit more all-encompassing or whatever. Yeah. But did you have that feeling that like, oh, I'm actually um, of a standard that I can boss these games? Because I remember you being a really um, like modern box-to-box. -box yeah, I mean, I always had confidence that I could play at the highest level. But if 
I don't know if you remember this, but I felt for my first two or three months, certainly two months, uh, my form was nowhere near the levels I expected myself. Really? I was, yeah, I was really disappointed with how I started here. Um, and do, you, I th- do you attribute that to anything? Just a change of club, a change of scenery, and you know. Um, was it a different dropping down? Uh, no, it wasn't. A, a dropping down wasn't an issue. It was, and I think the night that changed it for me was another club that I ended up working for as an assistant manager. We played Norwich City away at Carrow Road. And Paul actually played us on the right of a midfield instead of in my usual role in the centre. And I played a really good game. And that was the game for me where I turned it and I felt that I was, I'd showed the Fulham fans why you'd forked out a record fee at that time for mm. us. So it's strange to hear you guys thinking that I, you thought I started well because I personally didn't think it, I was anywhere in Yama levels. Um, so, yeah, I was... Uh, Really fascinating. Probably with the exception, I think we played Birmingham City in my first game, uh, which is strange as well, when I went on to manage them. But yes. we, um, and we, we played well. I think we won 3-1 on the, the night. Um, and uh, I played well that game. But I think for a few... F- I felt, yeah, I felt for the first couple of months, I was certainly not at the levels I expected to be at. But And then after that, I started producing the form that uh, I thought I could. And... I just, I think the fact when you're saying the words, I, I, I like, I was looked like I was like I could run the show. I think it was because I was enjoying my football so much. Yeah, yeah. And I enjoyed the environment and the relationship I had with the fans. So yeah, I think when when you've got all them factors, you do feel like you can push your chest out and and be give of, give the best showing of of what you're about. You yeah, know. Yeah, totally. And when, when Tagana comes in. It, in my head, you become like the Avengers, that team. <laughs> Louis Sahar comes in. Yeah, what a Barry signing. Water, obviously. Mal Brank. You and Sean Davies in the midfield. Mm. That was the most miraculous year of football, I think, I've ever seen. We, yeah. th- th- this guy, Tigana, opened our eyes because when we heard he was coming in, it was when Carl Haynes, Riedler and Roy Evans yeah, took over temporary. Co- and then we found out Jean was coming in and... Our holiday plans were cut short because <laughs> he, he brought us back for pre-season in June, which hadn't been thought of. <laughs> we were doing three sessions a day, 6 a.m., 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. What? And we were ridic- We thought, actually, that he wouldn't give any time to us. The Sorry, did you British- say 6 a.m.? 6 a.m., yeah. We used in to train. training? In tr- we trained. We used to go for a 5K run at 6 a.m. Uh-huh. under Tigana and then do a football session in the 10 o'clock session and a three a physical session Whoa. with Roger Propos, our fitness coach. Oh, <laughs> Rog. Rog. We've heard a lot about him. Everyone He's was frightening Rog, to be fair. A bit of a fair. legend, a bit of a myth. Rog, Rog yeah, could yeah. tell if you'd put weight on just by grabbing your, your cheek. So if he's seen us now, we'd be absolutely dis- <laughs> be absolutely distraught. Uh, how, so, did, how did everyone take to that, that sudden... You well, know, we thought thing. that he wouldn't want the British corn. It was actually yeah. the opposite. He loved the British lads' mentality of never giving up. Yeah. Given absolutely everything, so like some myself and Kit Simons, Chris Coleman, Kit. Sean Davis, yeah. you know Barry Hills, yeah. uh, yeah. those lads, Andy Melville, um, you know the, the Steve Finnan, yes. Rufus, Finnan. you know all these guys. Um, we, you know, he, he, what he done is he just took it to a new level because I, I considered myself to have high fitness levels in terms of the ground I covered during my career, but he just took us. To, Took us to a new and took me personally to a new level. And, really? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And I remember, you know, some of the games we played, the way we used to just pop the ball, but because we were so fit, we just were relentless with it. Um, you know, I remember, I think Dave Bassett was manager at Barnsley, and obviously we were with, getting a lot of plaudits because of the football we played. And we, they, he was bringing his team here, I think, and he, I think he come out in the press the before and said, oh, the, 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 we, we've got a game plan they'll not do this to us they'll not do that they'll not outrun us yeah. and it was nil-nil about the 80th minute and I think we blew Barnsley away 5 nil because we're fitness levels I think we scored five goals in the last 10 minutes of normal time and then four or five minutes of injury time because wow, we wow. just blew them away because their players were on their knees they'd kept up with us for 80 minutes but yeah. they couldn't do it any longer and it was, home, it was home and away it was relentless it was the manager not changing his philosophy uh, but he had us re- unbelievably fit. The, the jigsaw puzzle he had with his staff uh, was amazing. Because <coughs> you know? um, Christian uh, used to uh, do all the technical coach for Damiano, Jean, actually, yeah, yeah, Christian Damiano, and put on some amazing sessions. Um, but it was all it was all about us, you know. And he and he loved 
you know, there was there was times where he became angry with some of the French lads at times, rather than us, because he felt that they weren't doing doing enough. So there were the, what we thought that he would bring when he started signing some of these French players that they would be his boys yeah. in that us British lad. It was actually the opposite. He he was brilliant with us and uh, and whenever there's any times to, to to let rip, which he could. It was mainly with those lads, you know. So fascinating, the misconception you can have, because because when I think of that team, I think just pure class, yeah, just above it, just like not even breaking sweat. And so to hear that is really interesting because we spoke to Danny Murphy very recently about his team. Yeah, The way we remember that team is very well organised, worked really hard, all that kind of thing. And he sort of put me right and said, actually, there was a lot of quality. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. there's so much more going into football. Well, you mentioned Louis Saha, I mean, think, he probably goes down at this football club as one of the best ever signings, doesn't yeah. he? For the money we paid for him, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was, he 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 was just phenomenal. I, I knew about him because he, he went to Newcastle as a youngster when I had left and oh, under Ruud Hullet. So I knew I knew about him. But the issue with with Louis at, at Newcastle was he's a really young boy, but he'd, he'd gone away and played some football in France. And then when we brought him, wow, I mean. Speed, the yeah, agility, the, how high he could jump. I mean, yeah. he he jumped thinking he was gonna he was gonna head it and he'd catch it on his chest. And <laughs> he was the perfect player for me when I was playing in that ten role just off him. And you had Lewis's his, his speed, and if if he, if he linked Barry up alongside him or whatever, we, it was just phenomenal. And Steed on the other side or whatever, it was just like. It was it was perfect, What's you know. So cool is is you're naming these players or every single name you've said to like to Fulham fans. These guys are they're such heroes, aren't they? Every single one. Mm. Uh, what are your like? Can you give us a few sort of sort of tidbits about some of these players? Any any sort of things that stand out? Like you know, like when when Saha came in, you know, did you uh, instantly have a connection with him? Obviously, you, you did on the pitch, but you know, what was it like? Meeting oh yeah, him we, in had changing a, we, room? Had, we had we had. Strong straight away. Yeah. It's 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 a thing to see. And I, I don't know. It's just because obviously I've had a lot of success at the, the, all three clubs I played for. Um, in all those three clubs, we had gr- great uh, chemistry between the players, and and this one was no different at Fulham. You know, as you said, we had young Sean. So I was it flipped on its head where Paul Bracewell was my mentor. I'd become. Sean's mentor. Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure that's a good thing. Maybe that's why <laughs> that's why Sean's so crazy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, you know things like that, and um, you know John John Collins John was a Collins, big, yeah, John man. was a big one for us because he yeah. played for John at Monaco, yeah. and uh, so when he um, he knew and he could tell all us British lads what was going to be round the corner right. and what to expect and how yeah. how John was going to be working things. So. I mean, there was some you know great great times. Um, Did it go on a um, band catch up? <laughs> that's the that's See, the myth is, that goes yeah, around. Yeah, well, uh, our diet was totally you know well looked after. We would have all these tests when we went to Clairefontaine at pre season. Right, the French national camp. That's where we'd go for ten right ten days, fourteen days, and that was just intense. And this doc had come and take. Um, you know, uh, t- t- injections to see what we were low on, and and, and then we'd be oh. get he'd, he'd he'd know what we uh, what we were short of, etc. So wow. And um, the the good thing I liked was when Jean would tell us the stories about when he was playing for Marseille, and he, he played f- with alongside a player that I knew really well as a kid growing up, Chris Waddle, watching Chris, yeah, and, and his stories that him and the rest of the because Jean had a with Platini, he had his own vineyard, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. But John was n- not a wine man at all. He was a Stella man. He'd rather have a pe- <laughs> pint of beer. So yeah. he loved us British lads. Cause oh, we, really? uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he took us across there. Because whenever there was an international break or a break in the season, we never had it off. He'd take us abroad and we'd play Marseille behind closed doors no or way. Roma. Or we actually played in a six aside tournament against AC Milan no and uh, Marseille way. and Benfica. Yeah, there was hardly any days off. All behind closed doors? Yeah, no, these were the, the, the 11 v 11 games were, but this six aside. Say tournament roll on roll off subs was up in this out like indoor arena in Marseille. We played that on wow. the Friday and then on the Sunday we played Marseille behind closed doors. And then we went to his vineyard and uh, some he was like, "Oh, everyone have a taste of the wine." And he was like, "No, nah, I drink beer." And I was like, "Yeah, I'll have one of them with you, boss." Instead, <laughs> so yeah, it was good and it was like, yeah, it was um, it was a it was a great period. I just, just 
as you say, there's so many things to talk about. You know, there's still something, you know, click in your mind and you think about certain players from that time. You of know, course, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Do so, you, do you think it's weird that Tagana never did more in management? Because it, it, it seemed assumed at the time that he was going to be a big name for years to come. Yeah, I mean, he he, he went over to Turkey and stuff like Is that. that what didn't happened? He? Yeah. That was, I got the impression he was he was always wanting to be the French national team manager. Yeah. I think that was his big goal. I th- I, he might he might say it differently, but certainly the time I had with him, he was uh, he was brilliant. He, how he got the players and us especially to to, to think in his way, um, he was perfect uh, for for English football. Um, mm. You know, and he he had great knowledge, but he had great. Respect. I mean, you fans will probably remember him just being nice and calm with his toothpick in the dugout. Oh yeah, toothpick. Do you know, the do you know toothpick, in match yeah. days, he never really said anything. Right. Because he felt he'd done his work Monday to Friday yeah. and he trusted the players. Yeah. Don't get us wrong, if something had to be tweaked or said at half time, yeah. he was always there doing it. Yeah. Um, so pre-game, before kick-off, nah, there wasn't anything? Chilled. Everyone just knew what they Chilled atmosphere, really? yeah, yeah. Absolutely chilled. It was, you know, and that was not, that's not... Me saying that was wrong. No, I th- no, no. He felt, and he, he, we had, we'd done so much work on the Monday to Friday leading up to the game. He was like, my job's done, I'm trusting you now. Yeah. And then he had the 15 minutes at half time uh, to, to do it, you know. And he was one of the first, you've got to think then, you know, 2000, 2001, you know, we were starting to get f- footage of our opponent. So, for example, we're yeah. playing against Liverpool and I'd have a 10 minute clip of... Uh, Stephen Gerrard and Xavi Alonso from the previous five or six games. Yeah, and I know that's normal practice now, but not that. Back not then, then, you course. know that wasn't the type of stuff that was coming out. You know, and uh, everything was. And I'll never forget this day. We uh, we must have been playing on a Sunday or a, or a Monday or something on TV. So we were all in the training ground on the Saturday, and we were training on the uh, the main pitch at mm. Motspur, and uh, we were in the gym. And we were just doing some uh, weights with Roger. And all the academy teams were there. And to the youngest un- academy team, under sixes, they were doing exactly the same session as us. But we had weights where the little right. boys just had wooden sticks oh, wow. just to get the technique. Yeah. Wow. And then we went onto yeah. the pitch and done a football session. And when I looked down, all the teams were doing exactly the same session. Right. Every single team in the academy. Incredible. And it was like... It was jaw dropping. It was seeing from the little boys who started at the bottom of Motspur Park because as what they've done is they've done the pitches used to get closer and closer. <laughs> yeah, 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 so yeah, you get yeah. feeling as if you're getting closer to the first team and all the pitches and then every single pitch the same session was happening. Wow. It's like the evolution of man on uh, football yeah. pitches. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that incredibly. discipline that that must have instilled. Well, as that well, was that because I of I think that came from Christian as well because Christian had obviously run with Gerard Hulde the national school and. and Claire Fontaine in France, yeah. so he'd obviously done that f- from a young age, and that that was something he brought in, which mm. was phenomenal. Yeah. Wow, synchronization. Yeah, well, when you think about it, when when the young players did come into the team, you know, Sean yeah. and, and that and people like that. that yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, of course, and then later Leroy Le Senior because he'd yeah. been part of it, so it was uh, all all that type of stuff, you know. When um when sorry when when Tagana left and Chris Coleman obviously came in as manager, he he makes you captain. Yeah. immediately doesn't he yeah. was that something that you, did, you had a really good relationship with Chris obviously because yeah seen but I think it was the fact that I mean, and, and John always seen me as a leader as well I mean uh, so I felt like I was at that age like you say I was in the peak years of my career and always had leaderships I was always wanting to, to be a leader and I think that was just common practice for us it was something I, I really enjoyed you know and yeah in, yeah in, in a because sometimes it can it can uh, it can daunt people by getting that armband. It can affect how they do things, but I, I think it give me another uh, advantage as well. I was um, chatting to my dad on the way here, and he uh, when I said, "Oh, I'm chatting to yourself," and he said he had this memory of you, and it was uh, just gone. Uh, Man United just equalised after you'd scored. At Man Old United, just, yeah, at Old yeah, Trafford, yeah, yeah, just before half time. You'd gone one one, and you were doing that. He said he remembers it clearly. You were doing that to the team. Yeah, yeah. And he said, and that was it. And I love the fact that that's what he's and got. Yeah, yeah. That's how he goals. sees you. That that kind of. I know, was just trying to reiterate to the lads that we'd done great, and there was yeah. no reason why we could go on and win the game. I think, 
that's got to be a game that stands out for everyone, isn't it? Us going to Old Trafford while yeah. they had the team and the squad they had. Uh, they were the Premier League winners at the time, so we were... That was a phenomenal day. And beat them 3-1 that yeah, day. Yeah, beat them and, and deservedly beat them. And you scored the first yeah, goal. Yeah, Steed and uh, Ginichi scored the other one, I think. Yeah, yeah it would have been. Time, yeah. And so the, the first goal is typical you because you end up it almost in the six-yard box, yeah, actually, I don't did, you? Yeah, I did, yeah. Steed dispossessed someone and I got ahead of Rio Ferdinand, I think, and put it in at the near post. And then, uh, yeah, we, we played really well. We could have scored more than the three on mm. that day, actually. Yeah. We, we, we were our game plan. And the reason why it was even more impressive... We played against Newcastle in the midweek and we went 2-0 up through myself and Louis Soho. Right. And uh, Shearer led the comeback, didn't he? They scored one just before half-time and then I think he got two in the second half. Yeah. He got a penalty. to They beat us 3-2. So we were yeah. a little bit down after that because we'd let a 2-0 lead slip. And you've just done that at home, then you've got to go to Old Trafford. I'm not sure many people would have given us a chance right. to even get a point that day. Never yeah. mind go there and win deservedly. So, yeah, I mean... Chris then took on a lot of the things that Digana had brought in, but he also added his own personal touches to it as well. So um, that was a big surprise. I, I never got the impression when I first met Chris that he'd be want to become a manager. I was going to say, but he'd done a he'd done a terrific job. He he's, his recruitment. Steve Keane was a good addition because yeah. Steve was very good in, in his tactics and knowledge. And uh, yeah, Chris, Chris, um, you know that year. Where I think we finished ninth eventually, but if we hadn't a sold Louis in the January window, yeah, yeah. I think we could have gotten the top six that season. Yeah. So were we not sitting third or fourth when we, we sold were. Louis at Christmas? We That's were, right. yeah. First. So right. yeah, we, I think, and it was so late in the window, Chris really couldn't get that ideal replacement in. Yeah, mm. no, we had Brian. Brian was a different class striker, a different type of striker, wasn't he, Mac Braid? Yeah, um, a great guy as well, and a great player, but you know. We just give us that a little bit of something different, and he was a. That's why he went for that sort of money at that time, didn't he? To the yeah, to totally. the to the champs. So, did it um, flatten at all the uh, the feeling in the? In it the it didn't room flat. I didn't feel it like flattened it in terms of the the, the group. You just obviously knew that you were losing a, a a very very important player, a big player for you, who sure. was the difference between you winning and losing at times because he was that much of a difference maker, and. Uh, so it, 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 you obviously th- you know like well where we're going to have to tweak a little bit the way we play as well because we haven't got what Louis brought to the team that explosive and that power and pace. So yeah, talking about Louis the, the, in the Fulham flag right, you have got photos across here of the greats in the history of Fulham Football Club. And there's one of Lee just off behind my shoulder here where you're celebrating with Rufus Brevet, uh, Louis Sahar, and then um, Boa Morte. Yeah. And now Louis, obviously, like I, I imagine you were great friends. You felt like you yeah, were on yeah. the pitch. He's obviously got a huge role now at the club as a coach. Did you, yeah. did you imagine him being a coach? Did you see that happen? Yeah, I did actually. I thought he's a great guy. I've kept in touch with him, um, you know, over the years, and uh, he, he, he's such an infectious. Right when he yeah, came yeah, in the yeah. dressing room, yeah, you couldn't like get angry with boy. You know, he was just like, oh man, what a great lad, but. I just used to laugh when he used to do them scissor tackles, you know, <laughs> them, them legs used to come out and just used to start whipping you thinking, wow, this guy's That's nuts. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when he used to lose his temper, you could see it, you're expecting, like, you'd say it to someone, I'd say it to one of the lads, there's a scissor tackle coming out in a minute, yeah. don't worry about that. And, that uh, is so good. But when you think about it, in that first year, we played more with a four diamond two, yeah, and him and uh, Louis Sahar were the front two. And imagine oh, the right, yeah. speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the diamond at the time. Good was, luck, Barnsley. Yeah, <laughs> the diamond was Sean at the bottom, John Collins yeah. on the left, Bjarni yeah. Goldbeck on the oh. right, and me at the top. Oh, and then it was the, that front two. Oh. And then you obviously had Rufus and oh, Steve t- Finnan bomb, bombing down the lane. What a team! Um, so yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike and Goal and Chris and Andy Melville, and then all, all Kit. So the yeah. speed those two had, it was like. Sometimes these people say, oh, you know, some of the goals you made, but it's like, I just felt, because I, I was a good passer of the ball, like, these two players with their speed made it quite simple. Yeah. yeah. And then you're just like, aye. In terms weird. of like your playing career, would you say that season or any season for them would be up there with some, obviously, obviously at Newcastle you had some great years oh, with, in the early years. Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. I think, over a long, football? I think over a long period of time, if you're talking longevity, it'd be difficult to say that this wasn't my best time, yeah. Without yeah. a doubt. Um Played, played in some great games, um, you know. Played in some great players, great teams. Um, yeah, this, the, yeah, the, the clubs 
massive to me. It's it, it, everyone knows how important Newcastle United is to us. I'm born and bred. That was my team, and I'll always support them. But F- Fulham ran them very, very close. Yeah. You know, and we'll always do that. Um, there's only two two times. Well, it's four now because of my boy's situation at Liverpool. Sure. Four times over the course of the season. I'm not really wanting <laughs> Fulham to win. Well, it could be. It's more this year, obviously, with the Carabao Cup semi finals. Two over two legs. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's a really special place for me. Really special. We've only got like a, a few more minutes uh, left here, but there's a couple of things we just uh, just want to ask. There was always a bit of a room, obviously such a tight-knit team and the way you talk about them so fondly, you know, it sounds like you guys had a great bond. There was always a, sort of rumours of possible uh, secret nights out in, in, in uh, Wimbledon Village. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there anything you can say yeah, about Yeah, it was a great, it was a great <laughs> story. It was a great story one night. We're in Wimbledon Village on there. <laughs> and... Uh, you know the lads will tell you I'm not the I'm not the best at drinkers, but I didn't miss I didn't miss out on any social uh, evenings. I, I was I was at the forefront of them, <laughs> and uh, I came out. And sometimes in Wimbledon Village, it was so difficult to get a taxi. And you would like it was before the days of Uber, but you'd get into one. Yeah, that was maybe his own mark or something. In this night, like I'd had one too many, and I I gets in this car and I see his. Uh, I was living in Kingswood at Surrey at the time, so in, from Wimbledon Village. I says Kingswood, please. And I heard this, so I said, sorry, as Kingswood, but not in an English accent. And, and when I, l- I got my focus and I looked, it was Christian Damian. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the next day we got into training <laughs> and uh, I get to shout to go and see Jean Tigana. Yeah. And he was like, Lee what, Lee, what is this? What's happening? And I was like, God, boss, are you seeing <laughs> Is this, is this normal? I was like, no, 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 we never do this. <laughs> and when I was telling the lads, they were like, hey, that." Absolutely gutted because I'd like broken the secret code oh, yeah. <laughs> or two, just laughing their heads off at what had happened. So, That's I so think good. John then realized that, um, hey, listen, these lads work and play so hard, sure, uh, for the team, yeah. You know, if they do it at the right time, it's not an issue, but uh, it wasn't something he, he you know, he kept, he kept pushing. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there, there was a group of us that would, uh. Still kept kept that on, but we didn't do it regular, as you can, can you, imagine. Can you, can you name a few players that joined? Nah, I'm not going to. Th- if the other, la- if the other lads want to speak up, up about themselves, they can. But I won't be throwing them under the bus. But I can imagine you'd probably be able to name the six or seven that yeah, were there. Still, you know, sure, so sure, yeah, sure, sure. yeah. So uh, brilliant, brilliant. Lee, before you go, um, if you are centre midfield in an all-time greatest Fulham team, who would be your fantasy centre midfield? Centre midfield partner yeah. out of the following: All right. Moussa Dembele, oh dear me, yeah, Sean yeah. Davis, realistic that one. Wow, wow. Danny uh, Murphy, Danny Murphy, yeah. We'll throw Scott Parker in. Scott Parker or Johnny Haynes. <sighs> well, I did team up with Scott. I played with Scott at Newcastle. Right. So I had the. Uh, I was lucky enough to to, to play that one. I always had huge respect for Danny Murphy playing against him, and I thought he was outstanding when he came here as well. When I when I watched the team and his leadership in under Roy Hodgson, etc. Sean was a phenomenal talent, uh, fantastic talent. Then Belly, I've I've played against, seen him play ridiculous player players. Who I've 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 listened to players who've played with him, and they put him in. Sometimes put him as the best player they've yeah. ever played with. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And uh, well, I'm throw one more up. Johnny Haynes is one. the legend of this football club. And uh, Johnny Haynes of the modern era, Polinia. Yeah, Polinia. Yeah, Polinia, yeah. Great Polinia. Yeah. I've yeah, got to say, I haven't them. seen massive amounts of Polinia. I've watched a lot of Fulham games on, on TV, but I haven't, in comparison to, obviously, when I was coming to the football club and I learned about how highly thought of Johnny Haynes was, I, I, I Try to get as much footage and know knowledge about him and understand why he's held in such high esteem here. By the way, you've put us on the spot. So I've always been a I was lucky enough to already play with Sean and Scott. So I was I've always been a big fan of Danny Murphy. Okay. So I'd probably say me and him could probably complement each other. I love that. Because Danny could have that role where he's the pivot and just allows me to to bomb on and go and join in with the attacking player. So yeah, he's probably the player I would Especially the way he played when he was at this football club, I think uh, 
I would like to do that one, but that's not being derogatory the other ones. No, that's me. It's I wouldn't. I wouldn't be uh, spitting me. Du- I wouldn't be spitting me dummy out if I got picked alongside any of them. It's a beautiful answer because I think we think of you both in the same way as you're the talisman for both of those eras. Mm, so yeah, that feels doubt. like yeah. the exact characters yeah. of both yeah. sides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the leadership leaders. qualities we could bring Definitely. to the team as well. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Who would wear the captain's armband at the time? Oh, well, that would be the big problem. <laughs> yeah, that would be the fight, right? Yeah, that would be the issue. Yeah, yeah. The other one knocked on the manager's door yeah, yeah. why he hasn't got the armband. Yeah, what's the deal? I think in them days, it, 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 hey, listen, I'm immensely proud to have captained all three clubs I played for, but when you are captain, it is special. But it wasn't it wasn't the be-all and end-all. It, it, I was never going to be spitting my dummy out if I wasn't the captain of the mm. club. So, But yeah, that would be an interesting one. It would. Be, be a tough choice for the manager that's for sure yeah. Yeah. Lee man it's been such a pleasure like, brilliant Fulham will always think of you as a very very special player thank you so much that means, that means so much to hear them words They're very keen what I like about Lee Clark in, in that story when they're talking about the, uh, the naughty uh, nights out in uh, Wimbledon Village yeah. which uh, they weren't technically allowed to be doing but they did anyway mm-hmm. out of respect for his fellow teammates he, uh, he didn't name the other players uh, yeah, that, yeah. that were on the nights out with him, out, yeah. out of total respect. On the flip side, <laughs> we interviewed uh, uh, the one and only Chris Coleman. Great. Uh, Chris, great. And that's coming up in a few weeks. Um, who also relayed the story, yeah. but didn't have the same sort of respect for his fellow teammates and uh, gave us the names, mm. which uh, I quite like. I think it's worth also saying as well, if you're enjoying the podcast, Please, wherever you get your podcast from, remember to subscribe. And if you feel up for it, why not leave us a review? That'd be lovely. You'll find uh, in our history, in our recent history, uh, some amazing interviews. If you just stumble across us, Berbatov, mm. two part with Danny, Danny Murphy. That's great. Um, Steve Polinia, Sidwell, Polinia, Sid, uh, William. It doesn't end. Legrinsky. So if you're a Fulham fan, there is like a lot of depth and detail that we go into with yeah. true greats of the club.